prayers. Let us seek his refuge always. And the song is Let's Sing Unto the Lord, number 55. And we're just going to sing the English verses. And if you'll notice, the alleluias repeat. And then the final time through, we have that little coda at the end. So just follow along. We'll be fine. <laughs> I said all that and then I didn't follow my own roadmap. So good on you. <laughs> we had done that one last week, Kaylee, so that's probably why you were here. Well, good morning to young people and young people at heart. Uh, isn't this always a wonderful sight? This is such one of the highlights, I think, of the fall when we look at all the beautiful blankets and the mittens and the hats and the coats and whatever. It just, you know, makes a person feel really good to be part of this congregation. Uh, one of the scriptures for today um, begins with, the Lord is our strength, a very present help in trouble. Ah, oh, we have a youth. Good. <laughs> um, and I think that's, that's good to remember that, you know, there's so many things, and then uh, we'll hear the scripture later about all the ways that, that things that can happen in the world and how God is still there. We don't always know it's God. And I think that I'm, when I look at these blankets, I think, you know, how often, you know, how many parents are there in Lincoln who, you know, sometimes wonder when it gets cold, you know, can I really afford to go out and get my child a new coat, uh, gloves or whatever, or a blanket, you know, that... But then God comes through, and it's not that God is busy up there, you know, tying blankets. I mean, he's got a whole world to take care of, so we know he's not doing that. But that's why he's got us. We're kind of the hands uh, for God, and, um, and that's how he helps people. And um, I was also thinking how uh, yesterday at my little German classes at the German-American Society, we celebrated St. Martin's Day because it was celebrated all over Germany on Friday and how that sort of fits in with this too. Uh, and I've told the story before, but St. Martin was not always a saint. Martin of Tours, he lived in the 300s, so it's, it's been a while. This, and he's had a lot of stories attributed to him. But one of the stories is that um, he was a Roman soldier and, you know, he, 
had the, the sword, the helmet. He had the whole bed and a robe. And one night in the winter, he was riding his horse, and he saw a poor beggar, beggar sitting by the side of the road. Well, Martin, you know, the army didn't exactly pay him well. He had no money really to give the guy. He didn't have any food. But he got down, and he took his sword, and he cut the blanket, his robe, in half. And he gave half of that robe to the poor beggar by the side of the road. And uh, one of the stories says that that night, he had a dream, and he saw the beggar, and he found out that that was really Jesus. And we know that we have in one of our scriptures from Jesus that if you do it to one of the least of these, you do it unto me. And uh, so oftentimes when God helps us, it's not that he's directly maybe doing something, but he does it through us. And um, I just think that it's such a great time of year when we see this. And um, one of my favorite parts, I need to finish telling about Martin, is that um, he he was so determined after that that he was going to help people, and he quit being in the Army. And he might have made a, you know, would have fit in with some ways people's thinking today. And uh, he... Um, and he became a priest, and he continued being in the hands of God and doing things to help his parishioners. And uh, when it was time for a new bishop to be elected, the people, because he was such a good man, they decided he should be the, pre the bishop, but he was too humble. He didn't really want to be the bishop. He just liked being the guy who helped his parishioners. So one night, the people were going around with lanterns looking for him, and which is why there's now kids in Germany going around with lanterns on St. Martin's Day. And uh, he hid in a barn covered in straw. And uh, what gave him away, there were a bunch of geese there, and they were honking away or whatever it is that geese do. So the people found Martin hiding under the straw, and he did become the Bishop of Tours. And so as a reward for doing that, Traditionally, geese have been eaten at this time of year in many parts of Europe. But I just have goose cookies, so uh, and and she Olivia gets it. But you know the important thing to remember about Martin and what we do here is that we are the hands of God. That yes, God will come through for us, but um, it's oftentimes because the rest of us are doing it for for Him. We are His hands. So we'll remember that as we bless our blankets and coats today. Thank you, Ziggy. You know, I should have had a picture of her cookies up there. She sent me a picture. They were so cute. And I don't know if you noticed, Ziggy, that um, St. Martin was in our Sunday school lesson. We didn't touch on him, but he was one of the people that they discussed about impacting the church. <laughs> oh. Okay, I seem to have skipped something here after the call to worship. So we're going to go ahead and pray. So if you all stand, <laughs> that's something you should never forget. <laughs> Will you pray with me, please? Merciful Lord, we come with our own fears and worries that we need to lay down at your feet and trust in your ways, your promises. Help us as we struggle to live and be at peace in our hearts. Forgive us when we fail to rejoice and believe. Help us to be still and know that you alone are God. Abide in us, we pray. We need you. Amen. Now I'm going to read scripture today from Psalm 46, 1 through 11. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with us, tumult, Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be removed. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. 
The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Thank you, Shelley. And I was going to put a picture of this because you might not be able to see it. And I, I forgot to put it in there. I'm sorry, but you can see the mittens and more here anyway. <laughs> and we have been blessed in this congregation to have this wonderful group of ladies that meet monthly throughout most of the year. I hear there used to be men that attended too. <laughs> to make these one tie, these wonderful blankets. They're set out in every pew today and up here. We then ask for donations to be brought in, hats, gloves, mittens, and more, so that they can be brought to Clinton Elementary here in our community. And today, I am blessed for the third time to say a prayer of dedication for this ministry, for these gifts that we offer, for the givers as well as those who are receiving through this ministry. As we lift these up, I also would like to lift up Tiara for her healing of her foot, Lonnie, and I'm so glad you're here, and Susan, still in need of healing. Also, if you've read the email, Jay Sayers' stepbrother passed away in an accident yesterday, so please keep him in your prayers and his family. And all of those affected by war and disaster worldwide, we bring these concerns to the Lord. And we also praise God for the two sets of twins, one in the Unrau family, one in the Culver, Hicken Cup, Edgar family. What wonderful blessings right before Thanksgiving. Let us bow our heads and our hearts. Jesus, we ask that you bless these blankets, these items to keep some kids in our community warm during these winter months. Allow these items to be a blessing for their lives, the softness of the blankets to bring some sort of comfort and sign of love in their times that they use them. We praise you, Lord, for these gifts and those who have worked to make this happen here again in our midst. We thank you for those who worked to raise money for next year's fabric, for those who gave Lord, we are so grateful for how you make this ministry possible yet again. May our time of fellowship as we serve together for the good of the families of Clinton also bring us closer in relationship to each other and to you. Guide and be with us, we pray. Amen. Now let us stand and sing, Lord, Thou Dost Love. Number 387, verses 1, 2, and 4.
Shall we? Shall we? It's okay. Okay, our second scripture reading comes from Psalm 32, 1 through 11. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no inequity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silent, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heart of summer, Selah. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my inequity. I said, I, am, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgive the guilt of my sin, Selah. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you, at a time of distress, the rush of mighty water shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cities of deliverance, or cries of deliverance, Selah. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright of heart. Thank you, Shelly, Maggie, Haley, Cindy, Siki, Bud, and Andrea, all those that help during the worship to make it meaningful. We appreciate your service. And no matter who we are, what we have, where we live, we will all have heartaches that we have to go through in life. No amount of faith, piety, or positive mindset can create a seal-proof barrier there will always be valleys we must go through, as some say. Some of the worst may be the loss of a loved one. One might go through any number of tragedies or disasters, an attack or a war or even a famine. Yes, tragedy or crisis is a certainty of life, unfortunately. Which brings to my mind Jesus' words in John 16, 33. In this life you will have trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. We'll get into that phrase, overcome the world, more next week. Now, in some translations, it says you will have trouble. Some says face trials or have sorrows. The NRSV says face persecution. Whatever the case is, Jesus knows everyone throughout time and history would face hardship. And some translations say have courage instead of take heart. And Paul says in, verse, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and self-control. But let's face it, in a time of major sorrow or fear, a crisis of some sort, whether real or in our mind, it's hard to grasp this, to hold on to this promise to sense the power within of the Holy Spirit. It sometimes is hard to have courage as well as self-control. In our prayer group meeting this week, we discussed a little of the must prayers versus the ought prayers. And the must prayer is often found in a hospital room or beyond what they think they could handle. They are relinquishing to God, for they know that they need him in that moment. But as Sky Jathani notes in her book, Jesus was, What If Jesus Was Serious About Prayer, we often fall too easily back into the ought prayer, like it's a duty 
or that we're trying to get a reluctant God to attend to us, putting our prayer in parentheses, as he says, when our sense of control resumes, when things feel like they're back to normal, when the trial is either accepted or it ends. In Psalm 46, we heard a similar theme to what Jesus said in the John passage, but with more details. God is our refuge and our strength, always ready to help in times of trouble, so we will not fear, and then gives dire examples of things, metaphors for the walls crumbling in in life, earthquakes, mountains crumbling and trembling with soaring water, but a river, it says, brings joy to the city of God, where God dwells in which cannot be destroyed. The nations are in chaos and their kingdoms crumble, it says. Boy, we sure see that today, giving us stress and anxiety. And even some of those natural things are occurring, right? But it says the Lord is with us. God is our fortress. God will cause the wars to end. It says he will break the bow and burn the shield. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored throughout the world. You can see why this text reminded me of the song I played by Mercy Me during gathering music, Even If. No matter what happens in our life, we can find our refuge in knowing that God is able. In the midst of what seems like the end of the world in the moment to us, it can be well with our soul. In the 32nd Psalm, which Shelley also read to us, it says, happy are those whose sins are forgiven. We have no, they have no guilt because they are covered. And we know now that this is through the blood of Jesus. While I kept silent, my body wasted away, said the psalmist. Through my groaning day and night, your hand was heavy on me and my strength was dried up. Then in verse 5, he says, I acknowledge my sin to you. I hid no more. I confess my transgressions, and you forgive my guilt. Salah. Therefore, he continues, let all who have faith offer prayer to you at a time of distress, for you will preserve us and surround us with glad cries of deliverance. And now we hear what the Holy Spirit does and through the word of God, as we hear him speak to us, I will instruct you in the way to go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. See, God sees us. He hears us and he cares for us and he is with us. Then a little of the self-control Paul talked about in verse 9. He writes, do not be like a mule without understanding, with a temper needing a bridle else it will not stay near you. Meaning our peace to me, given by God in the midst of distress, it can't stay with us if we don't stop, take a breath, try to find gratitude, the peace of Christ that's always available. But if we stay in our head in our pity or anxiety or our fear, we cannot have the joy and peace of Christ in our hearts. Instead, we'll stay in our sorrow or distress. So we need to relinquish in order to receive. In this psalm, we also hear of this preservation, which I believe comes through prayer. As Sky Jathani would say, through our communion with God. And here again in his quote from C.S. Lewis, as we look up to God in prayer, he gives us the unimaginable dignity of looking back and he offers us rest, as one of the scriptures we looked up said during our prayer group. So cry out to God, even if you're angry, feel abandoned by him. Jathani quoted Richard Foster, who said, God is big enough to receive us with our mixtures when we come to him in prayer, even in our tangled mass of motives, and I say our emotions as well. So what's a key at a time of lament when we feel we're at the end of our rope, so to speak, prayer. It is the answer because it's the root of our faith, our connection with God. 
and what could give us a sense of peace in the midst of our trials that we must endure because we're human. And so a shameless plug for our prayer group meeting. I hope you will join us this Thursday at 10 a.m. in the Annex or Wednesday 11.30 at 6.30. Church, it is vital that we pray together. This is not just the answer in our times of distress in our individual lives, but also for us as a community of faith. In the midst of the unknown, when we don't know what the future will hold, we need to be people steeped in prayer together, seeking not just the will of God and our transformation, not just seeking the will of God in our lives, sorry, but also for us as a community of faith. In the midst of the unknown, when we don't know what the future will hold, we need to be seeking for God's transformation to embark where we may not want to go, but God is beckoning us to be. And also for the peace we will need to see clearly, to feel at ease, and to know that God is with us. Now I'm going to turn to another book I've been reading that I picked up at annual conference titled Blessed Youth, Breaking the Silence About Mental Illness with Children and Teens by Sarah Griffith Lund. Did you know in a 2019 Pew Research study, 70% of teens said anxiety and depression were major problem amongst themselves and their peers? And this was before COVID. I think social media and other stressors have exacerbated these issues in the last decade at least. There seems to be an exponential increase of mental illness, and not just with kids or teens, but with adults of all ages. And the church has never really been a safe place to discuss these issues, I say. There's still such a stigma in society about talking about it even, and maybe even especially in the church. In this book, Lund quotes Dr. Becky Kennedy, who says, happiness naturally finds kids and adults who have learned it is okay to be who they are. So like I said, come to God as you are with your mess, for Jesus offers rest. Oops, sorry. Sarah discusses how each person has unique stories in their battle with mental illness, and our job as people who love them and want to care for them is to help create spaces for these stories to be told, honored, and respected. We're offering them grace to be who they are and accept them that way. Teens and kids are not afraid to ask tough questions, she says. Even though we might feel discomfort and inadequacy in having conversations about mental illness, we need to lean into this with an open mind and compassionate heart. They should hear beyond, behind all of our words, no matter what, I've got your back, she says. Mental health challenges affects one's self-worth. It can make one feel unlovable, unwanted, and unworthy. But Jesus offers rest. And I think he wants us to offer rest as well. One way Lund says to support positive mental health is to connect people with faith communities that mirror back to them their belovedness as children of God. Faith communities, Lund says, can integrate mental health education and advocacy into their mission and ministries. This commitment shows their unconditional positive regard and celebration of every person as God's beloved child. The UCC Mental Health Awareness Network developed a process called WISE, helping faith communities become welcoming, inclusive, supportive, and engaged. And we as a church are involved in the BMC organization called the Supportive Communities Network, you may know. And while this is focused on being welcoming and affirming to the LGBTQIA community, I think it could be expanded to being welcoming to those with disabilities, those suffering with mental illness. We have a welcoming statement that we're gonna look at in a little bit that does say that. Any communities, I believe, should be a place where stories can be told, struggles, 
be not just prayed over, but listened to. All people have an innate desire to be heard, seen, validated, I believe. And so we come to the mustard seed and leaven lesson again. How I think the parables of Jesus are not just about our relationship with God, but also have to do with our relationship to others. How we are to create spaces where seeds can grow and refuge can be found. How we can be like the leaven, affecting the whole loaf, the whole person, the whole community, and the world with our kindness and our compassion and our empathy. Which I think Ziggy touched on a little. Now I'm still reading this book. I'll share some more of the lessons with you. But I think this can relate to an order of business we'll be conducting in a short while in our congregational forum as we decide on a purpose statement for our church, which will thus lead to a renewed mission and value statements next year. It's not about the words we choose, though, but in our reflection, I think, our purpose and our discussions and our mindset of who we are and how that will guide us in the future in our journey led by the Spirit so that we can better reach the world, be the leaven and the mustard seed, how we can be transformed ourselves and as a church to best do the will of God in this place and time and as God's beloved community. You know, I don't know why we have such a stigma about mental illness. I think we actually all have some form of it in some shape, form, or level because we all have sin. And remember, sin is what separates us from God. But he wishes for us to be reconciled, to be whole. This month on MyBridge Christian Radio, there's been a morning conversation where the speaker says a couple of related statements that I wanted to share with you. She says, you want rest, but God wants restoration. You want a break, but God wants a breakthrough. Relating to this finding peace or joy even in the midst of trials, we must remember that God may not wish us to go through something, but we live in a broken world. But he can use things to go through to provide wholeness or breakthroughs in our lives. This week, my prayer app on my phone gave me a notification to pray. And when I clicked on it, the scripture reference was Romans 5, 3 to 5. It says, we glory in our sufferings because we know they produce perseverance. Some translations say patience, some endurance. But all these, it says, produce hope. So even in our tough times, we could be incredibly hard to go through. Just know that hope will arise, that joy will come. Tomorrow's a new day, and God would love to hear about what you're going through. And there's a picture I did not share with you from Sky Jathani's book on prayer as we discussed it on October 30th, but I did show the prayer group meeting this week. It's a person trying to vault themselves over the wall of a castle, the fortress of God just representing. They're trying every way, Jathani says, to get to God by being good enough, by saying the right things. All the while, though, God is standing at the open gate waiting for them to just walk right in. This is in his section about prayer being dependent on grace. It's not because we're good enough or we keep bugging him. Remember, God's listening, and he cares and wants to commune with us. We don't earn our way to heaven. We don't earn our way into his heart through prayer. It's all about grace. And I will leave you with that today. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for the humility and the grace to not only come to you as humble, dependent children, but to be there for each other, to be a listening ear, allowing stories of hurt and distress to be heard, respected, and for us to mirror back your grace to those we love, those we come in contact with, and as a community of faith, grant us the courage to know you are with us, to be led with humility and follow in your ways all of our days. Thank you for being our rock and our refuge in our distress. 
Allow us the grace to come to you for restoration and peace. Search us, Lord. Allow us to come to the lakeshore to be filled with your presence. Amen. And now let us stand and sing our closing hymn, Lord, you have come to the lakeshore, number 229. Let your God know of your pain. Offer it to him and hold on. God will work in your life, for he cares. <laughs> 